Hi, I'm Lee Briggs from ResTech Roofing Systems and I'm here today at JJ Roofing Supplies to show you guys how to install a FlexiTech 2020 multi-surface overlay system over the top of a pre-existing felt surface. Our ResTech can be bought from JJ Roofing Supplies. So the first thing we must do before overlaying a pre-existing surface is make sure that that surface is fit for purpose. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to walk the roof and we're going to make sure the substrate is soundly solid. So we don't want any board underneath that might be rotting and failing. Second thing we're checking for is to make sure that the felt in this case that we're overlaying is fully adhered down to the board. If it is damaged or failing any which way, we must repair them areas first prior to going over the top. The second thing that's quite important we do is we make sure that there's not too much trapped moisture under the roof, caught in the roofing void. So what we must do first is perform adequate moisture tests. This can be done using moisture readers and we can make sure that it's less than a 20% moisture content before overlaying. Once we're happy and satisfied that the surface is, is ready or fit for purpose, what we would firstly do is we would remove any pre-existing perimeter trims that we can then lay new ones over the top. So what we're going to do now is we're going to now begin to install our preformed profiles. Um, just to reiterate, we don't have to do this. We can go over the pre-existing profiles that are there. It's just better practice to remove them and replace them with new. Um, so the first thing we would have done after cutting them off is we would have installed some perimeter battens like so. These are two, one reinforced the preformed trims that are going over the top and two giving us something that we can bond the face of them trims to. So the first trim we're going to install is obviously this trim here and this would be a drip trim that is designed to roll over the edge of the roof into your gutter line. So before installing this trim obviously we're going to need to cut this down to size um, which we've already pre-done. Then we're going to stick this into position obviously using a flexible adhesive. So the first thing we're going to do with a flexible adhesive is just across the batten here we're just going to do a nice continuous bead of that adhesive. And what this is going to do is prevent the trim from blowing up in high winds and obviously causing the trim um, to possibly split. So we've done a nice continuous bead. All we're going to do then is just bring our trim over into position and then we're just going to rub over it a few times just to make sure that we're fully bonding it down to the face of the batten there. And then we can tack the trims down into position. Um, as far as tacking it down really, the, the best thing to use is just clout nails um, with a hammer, they work fine. So really the best thing to do is starting from one end is just to pre-pin it first. This gives me the opportunity to line up and square my trim and then tack that into position. Then I can move, move roughly into the middle of the trim and I can repeat the same. Again, just adjusting it till I feel it has connection with the batten there. And then I can do the same again at the furthest point like so. Then now I can just go along and infill the gaps with the correct fixing spacings and they want to be anywhere between 100 to 150 mil spacings. So I'm just going to go along and tack them into position. Great, so now that trim's stuck down into position. Good practice really, the second trim that's always good to install is our upstand trim or our wall fillet that goes up against any solid structure. So to install this trim, this trim isn't needed to be bonded into place using a flexible adhesive purely because firstly it's going to be within the perimeter of the roof where we're going to fix it down and it would then be finished over the top of this using either lead or assimilated lead flashing to terminate the end of the roof. So to install this trim it fixes down in a similar way. First thing we're going to do is on this trim it does have two surfaces so you can clearly see there's obviously a flat incorporates a 45 into another flat. One flat is larger than the other one so ideally we would always put the larger flatted area up against our solid surface. This will give us our minimum requirement of our 150mm upstand against any abutment. So to install this trim pretty similar to the first one. We just want to pre-pin it first. Then the idea is this trim compresses into the wall. So this should be nice and flat against the wall and nice and flat against our deck. So the only gap should be behind the profile here, okay? The idea of that is that means it's holding it tight to the back wall there. So again, I always fix it in the same way. I go in the end, I work my way into the middle of the trim and it's just a gentle push into position and then fixing it down again and then the same there on the back edge. Now I can go along and obviously infill my gaps again using my correct fixing spaces of 100 to 150 mil. 
Now all the preformed trims obviously have been cut down today but what the trims do is they come in three meter long lengths um, when you buy them okay from new so obviously at some point on a roof you're going to need to extend past three meters so the idea now is what we're going to show you is how you would join two trims together um, in that circumstance so obviously now it comes up to where i need to extend my trim past three meters okay so minimum requirement of overlap is 50 mil. Now you can go more than 50 mil if you like, but the minimum overlap should be 50 mil. It also should be supported on that joint using our flexible adhesive. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna just run roughly two beads of adhesive up the trim like so. Okay, then we're gonna bring our trim over the top. Again, we're gonna line it up and we're just gonna push and squeeze that in first just to make sure it nicely spreads okay and then we can again fix it down into position so firstly i'm going to fix it from my furthest point then i'm going to hold it into position and then i'm going to tack it down again i'm going to work into the middle of the trim and then i'm going to adjust it into position again and then fix it down and then the same again my furthest point And then I can infill my gaps at my 100 to 150 mil spacings again. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to install our B trim. Um, this B trim or raised trim um, incorporates a tilt fillet there, so it's it's designed to shut off any open sides of the perimeter of the roof there and preventing the water from being able to run off. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do when installing this trim is firstly it would be cut down to size which we've already done the second thing we're going to need to do is we're going to need to bring these two trims together now the best way to bring these two trims together is firstly, firstly from the back edge where the two meet here we just want to do roughly a 45 mitre from the top corner here down to where it meets the trim so the best way to do that really is just mark the outer edge and just roughly where the trim meets and then what we can do is we can do a 45 like this okay so all we're going to do now is just with a pair of snips like this is just literally 45 the trim to bring the two together that should bring me nice and tight now into the back edge of my roof like so now all i need to do is bring the front end together so the easiest way i find to bring the two front trims together is we want to just mark where the two trims meet like so and then we just want to remove a small section of the trim. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to cut just into the curve here and then just nice and straight across. So I'm just cutting, if you like, a rectangle out. Like so. Then obviously I want to make sure that they fit and line up. Now, if it is sitting a little bit long like this, what you might have to do sometimes is just trim a little off the back edge. So in that case, all we would do is just remove a little bit more just to bring the profiles tighter together and again then we want to test fit and make sure it fits nice so we're looking for the two front trims to come together nice and square like this and the last and final thing we want to do is just remove the drip edge of the trim off underneath here so all we're going to do for that is just a small 45 incision something like this Now when we bring the two trims together, you'll see it just tidies up that edge a little bit and makes it look a little bit more tidy. Okay, so now the trim is obviously trimmed to size, okay, and brung together. We can now put our flexible adhesive on, being that it's a perimeter trim. So it's a nice continuous bead of adhesive along that batten there. And then we can bring the two together nice and tidily. So then we just want to again smooth that adhesive into the face of the trim so we know we've got a nice bond and then you should see it should hold it into place. Then all we want to do is then fix that down again. So firstly we always start or I always start from the front edge. This is important because this is what's going to be visual so we want to make sure we get a nice square finish. So firstly, I'm just with my hands, I'm holding it square to the batten and I'm just giving it a very, very light pinch, if you like, just to pull it down to the deck, just so we sit in as square as possible there on the face. 
then I can pin it into position. Then I can do the same again and I can move into the center of the trim and I can do the same again. So I just want to adjust it into position and then fix it down. And then again, at the furthest point of where the trims meet here, I want to do the same. Now I can see that my trim's sitting nice and square, I can then continue to fix it down at the correct fixing spacings. Um, so the stage we're going to move on to now is we're obviously going to prime our felt ready um, for our lamination stage to go over the top with our FlexiTech. Um, most surfaces do require priming, um, but what you can do is if you refer to the ResTech website, um, that you can download our application manual from there and that will state the different primers for the different surfaces. The primer we're going to use today is our FlexiTech uh, multi-surface primer and this one does require a hardener addition for it to cure. Okay, um, This primer here is used uh, on most surfaces you're going to come across, hence why it's called multi-surface primer. Um, and this primer goes over anything bitumous, so your felt and ash felt. It also includes masonry, so if you wanted to go over like brickwork, blockwork, concrete, anything like that, it'll also adapt for that. And in some cases, it'll also adapt for aged liquids, but we do recommend doing bonding testing before priming over any aged liquid surfaces. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is open our primer tin. Now, once we open this tin, obviously, because it's been sat for a while, you do get a little bit of separation in the tin. So what we're going to do before decanting it is we're just going to pre-mix it to bring all that together. Um, and that's as simple as just using um, a drill and a whisk. So we're just going to bring this in and we're going to mix it now. We're going to mix it for around about 30 to 60 seconds, dependent on once we start getting a vivid colour. This primer is white, so we're looking for it to be continuously white all the way through. Uh, so once we know that it's fully mixed together there and we're happy, we can obviously then remove the whisk. Obviously bear in mind that it is a liquid um, and when uncatalyzed, um, it can release an odour. So we want to just try not to have too many spillages in areas where we're not going to prime. Um, so now we're going to decant into our mixing bucket. Now what these are, these are ResTech mixing buckets. These are a handy guide to get an accurate ratio of our primer or our resin when we come to use it and our hardener addition. So firstly, the bucket has a scale up the side here, and this is the amount of liquid we're gonna put in, in liters, okay? Then as the bucket is spun round, we then have a powder hardener addition chart. Now this will e e echo, okay, under temperature, how much powder hardener we should put in, which we'll explain a little bit more in a minute. So firstly, we need to obviously put our primer in. So once our primer's then been put in, we can remove our primer. And it's always best practice to put the lid straight back on, at least that way, if we was to knock it over or anything, we're not gonna have any chemical spillages. Now we can come onto our hardener. So when you first buy the hardener, it'll come in a tub like so, okay? When we open the tub inside, what we will find will be two bags of powdered hardener okay like so and then we will find um, a measuring scoop now this is vital to make sure that we're getting an even amount of hardener in so the first thing we're going to do is obviously decant our powder hardener into our tub now what you would normally do is you would put both of these in at the time of opening it so again obviously if it's a windy day we want to be careful that this doesn't blow up or blow around or get in your eyes or anything so i'm just trying to keep it nice and low there to the bucket that if the wind does get behind it it's got a barrier it's blocked there by the bucket now you can see that the powder is decanted into the bucket now we need to work out what the quantity is or the ratio of hardener to primer so to get the quick ratio now of hardener to primer i'm going to use my ResTech supplied uh, deck temperature reader and all I'm doing is looking to get a reading of the deck. Now once I've got that reading of the deck I'm looking around 13.9 degrees okay so I'd round that to 14. Now I refer to my bucket knowing that 11 to 17 14 falls between that so now all I need to do is add six level scoops of hardener. Then what we can do is we now mix that powder into the resin there and what we're going to do to do that is we're going to use our drill whisk again, okay? And again, it's, it's 40 to 60 seconds, something like that. And we want to just be a little bit controlled and careful here because obviously the hardener going in obviously allows it to cure. So anywhere this might splash or go, um, 
obviously could be quite difficult to remove after. So we want to try and be controlled or do this in a controlled manner. Brilliant. Let's have we just remove this off. So now we've mixed up our material, we can begin to prime our surface. So now we're going to begin to apply our primer and we're just going to use uh, a, a, a nice pole here uh, with a fluffy head attachment, okay? And all we're going to do is as we're applying the primer here, we're just looking to lose the natural colour. So, so we're not trying to get it on really thick, um, so it's swimming in it. We're just basically, in this case, looking to turn the felt um, white. So if, if you can see just closely here is what we don't want is we don't want any opaque areas where the felt's still bleeding through. We want to make sure that it's fully white like this. Now, it doesn't have to go on the trims, but if we happen to get it on the trim, it isn't going to cause any issues. Really, at this case, it's only the felt we need to prime because the preformed GRP trims um, don't need any primer or don't require primer. That's it, and then just make sure that it's tight to the trim here. So obviously what it should look like now is like what you have now is where it's consistent white where the primer has fully capsulated um, the old pre-existing felt there. Now we need to wait around 40 to 60 minutes just for that to tack off and cure that then we can stand back on the roof and begin our preparation for our lamination stage. So after 40 to 60 minutes like we are now, the surface uh, should be dry or touch dry. So we don't want to be touching the surface and anything coming away with our hands. We want to make sure it's fully cured before walking on it. Now we're going to start prepping the roof ready for that lamination stage. So the first thing we're going to do um, is we're going to use our one meter wide chop strand mat here to cover the substrate surface. So we're going to need to cut that down to size. Um, it obviously one metre wide comes on different coverage rolls um, and it is a 225 gram. Now the reason we use a 225 gram is because we want to increase the flexibility of our product. Okay, so that's the first thing we will be doing. The second thing we're going to do is we're going to use our 75 mil taping mat. Now we're going to use this to go around the roof to reinforce the trim joint um, to, the, to the substrate. And also we're going to use it for any details or corners that we might want to close off. So the first thing I'm going to do before any preparation is I'm going to close off my front corners here. And the reason I'm going to close these off is to give myself something to mould my fiberglass to. Um, so generally the best thing to use is, is just a masking tape. So now I can prepare my main matting for my main bodied area. So all I'm going to do now is I'm just going to adjust the matting so it's slightly longer than I want it to be. Then I can use the perimeter lines of the trim to cut it in nice and tight. So in between each run of the matting, we always want to have a minimum overlap of 50 mil. And we always want to be bringing the torn or feathered edge over the top of the straight edge so we get a seamless joint. So once we've pre-cut all our main surface area, we're now just going to roll these up and leave them in an order that we can remember how we're going to use them. So now we're going to prepare our 75 mil reinforcing tape. Again, we're just going to use this to reinforce any trim joints. So it's always best practice to tear the mat rather than cutting it with a standing knife. What this does is it keeps them torn or feathered edges to always keep it blending together to make the joints invisible as possible. So now we've reinforced all our trims, we just need to obviously prepare some matting for any areas of open trim. One thing that's important to remember here is anywhere where we're reinforcing a corner or, or a trim joint, we must always use two layers of the reinforcing tape. So obviously when it comes to reinforcing our front corners here, we could do it with the taping mat, but we're gonna end up with, you know, maybe three or four um, strands of matting, if you like, just to do one corner, which is time consuming. So what I find best practice is to use an off cut off the main body to prepare my front corners. So what I do is literally this. I do a square as big as my hand. Now this one square, is enough to cover that corner in one go. So like I said before, it's two layers to reinforce all corners and trim joints. So I repeat this now three more times. So I've got two for each corner. Now that's all our matting prepared, ready for our lamination stage. So the, the next stage we're gonna do is we're gonna open up our resin and we're gonna prepare that to start laminating our deck surface. So firstly, we need to open the tin. Now that we've opened our tin of, of resin, we can remove the lid. Um, and when we first 
um, remove the lid, what you'll see is there is some separation in there. So again, we need to make sure we mix that through adequately, adequately um, for, for 30 to 60 seconds using a paddle whisk. So now I'm gonna pour the required amount I need um, into my bucket, but firstly, I'm gonna do a small amount because I'm gonna go around and do my detailed areas first. So again, the resin is the same as a primer. It does require a hard enough for it to go off. So again, we're gonna do the same mixing ratios. We're gonna follow our scale of, of amount or quantity, and then we're gonna use the same addition chart accompanied by our deck temperature sender to get the right amount of hardener. So 14 degrees, working off the same scale again. It's around about six scoops, the same as before. So now again, we're gonna mix for 30 to 60 seconds. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna seal our trims, corners, trim joints, and also trim to deck. Now you can do this in any order. I prefer to do the more detailed areas first. So I would laminate corners and trim joints. And what I tend to find works best is ideally, um, this is a small area so we could do it on the roof, but we would have a bit of board as like a spot board. We would use that to control the mess and wet out our details first. So what we're looking for here is to put some resin underneath, embed the matting into that resin, and then apply more resin over the top. And we're looking just to make sure that we fully saturate or cover the matting. Then we're gonna offer it up into place. So now, this will require around 30 seconds or so to start breaking down, to become supple enough to mold. So while I'm waiting for this, I'll prep another corner. Now this one's had a few seconds to start breaking the matting down, it'd be more pliable to dress into position. So all I'm gonna to need to do here is take the worst of the resin off my roller to prevent too much spillage, and then dress that into position. Before moving on to this one, I'm gonna get the second layer pre-soaking to save me time. Now I'm gonna repeat that process on the other joints and corners across the roof. Um, so now I've done all my uh, more technical details, if you like, or more time consuming details, I'm now gonna re reinforce the trim to the deck. So all I need to do here is firstly apply the resin, then embed the matting into the resin, then apply more resin over the top. And I'm looking for the matting to start breaking down and give a, give a nice swirly effect. So what we mean by swirly effect is if you wanna come a little bit closer, you'll be able to see the difference between the part here that I've broken down which is like a nice swirly effect to the dry, tight fibre, um, which is why I haven't broke down. We visually should be seeing this after going over the top with resin and not this. After each trim has been sealed down with the bandage, we give one, one coat of resin over the remaining bare trim. So we just do this with whatever loose we have on our roller. It doesn't need to go fully grey because when we apply the second coat, it will clear up. So now I've moulded my two layers of, of fibreglass on my front corner here. I'm gonna use this, it's a finished tissue. Now this doesn't add any reinforcement value, but what it does is gives a better aesthetic finish. So it will continue the smoothness of the trim around the corner, rather than seeing this obvious moulded fibred corner. So we don't need any extra resin at this point. This is why we do it while it's still wet. We just wanna lay the tissue over the top, the finished tissue. So I've torn it to size, and I've torn it to keep them blended edges. Then with my roller, no extra resin, I can roll that in and you'll see it'll soak up the resin from behind. So now we've finished and completed all, all bandages works, we're now going to pour out more resin um, to use for our main substrate. So the same method applies again, so it's surface temperature to get our adequate mix. Which again is our 14 degrees and that will equate to the same six scoops we used last time. So basically what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start wetting out our main body. But what we need to do is not overwork ourselves. So when we're working in larger volumed areas, we wanna work in one square, square meter sections at a time. So ideally what we want to do is we want to pour some resin out and then we wanna spread that over our one square meter. And what we're looking for is to get a little skin of resin, if you like, more like a little bit of a puddle line there. Then we want to put our matting straight over the top, dry, obviously. And then now we want to embed that matting into that resin. 
So we're going to go back over with our roller with no extra resin. And we're basically going to just embed it in to that resin skin underneath. Now we simply need to apply more resin over the top. So I always find we just pour a little bit out, but we don't do it in one area. Now what we want to do is we want to evenly distribute that resin over that area. And what we're looking for again, is we're looking for it to change from that tight woven fiber to that swirly pattern. Anywhere that we're still seeing that tight fiber and it's not quite turning to that swirly pattern, we just want to apply a little bit more resin. And once we're happy that that's done, we can then move on to our next section. And now this is where we need to make sure that the torn edge is coming over the top of the straight edge to get a seamless joint. And remember, it must be the minimum 50 mil overlap. Now the last thing I like to do is just to lose this obvious straight edge along the front here, I like to just stretch the matting slightly to blend it in. So with your roller, you know, we can just adjust the matting towards the front edge of the trim like so. Obviously it has to be done after it's had a bit of time to soak. And once the matting's stretched, we can just roll the roller back over the top, just so it dresses it down to the face of the trim. So now we just need to wait again for around 40 to 60 minutes for this to fully cure, and then we can just apply a second coat of the liquid and that would be the roof finished. Now that our main uh, reinforcement laminate stage has gone off, uh, we can actually apply the finished top coat over the top, which is the same resin again, um, used with the same hardener in the same way, okay? So firstly, we're just gonna pour out the desired amount. Then we're gonna check our surface temperature in the same way which this time might be a few degrees higher, uh, being that obviously it creates heat when it's curing. So now we're around 19 degrees. We spin our bucket around. So this time being we're 19 degrees, we're working on the 18 to 30, the higher end. So now we simply need to apply just four scoops of hardener. So before applying the top coat stage, it's just good to bear in mind that these roofs don't require any rubbing down. However, if there was any areas you wasn't happy with, you can sand them down lightly with some sandpaper, and then you can just clean away the dust with some acetone first. And generally, if they're left over 42 hours, we would recommend that you'd acetone, or if left overnight and contaminated by moisture. So firstly, we're just gonna obviously do the detail work. So all we're looking to do now is just basically second coat them trim. So I'm just firstly loading out some resin, but you should be able to see now with the second coat of the resin, how it loses that textured effect. Brilliant. So once we've gone round and we've cut in our perimeters um, and the main perimeter areas are all done, we will now move into the main decked areas um, and obviously repeat the same process. So as we're rolling out the deck, we, we have a couple of options. The resin can obviously be applied as a very thin coat, which will still maintain a fibre effect, or it can be applied slightly thicker uh, to achieve a smoother glass-like finish. So that roof now will take another 40 to 60 minutes um, for that to fully cure, um, and that is it. And that is as easy as it is to install our FlexiTech multi-surface overlay system. So just remember, even though we've overlaid felt today, our FlexiTech 2020 multi-surface overlay system can be actually laid over an array of different surfaces, including new deck application. It comes with a 20 year materials guarantee, which is unlocked by contractors that attend one of our ResTech training courses. And the training is at the Roofing Training Academy because if it's on the roof, we stock it.